Hi, welcome to Wired Souls, where we discuss about the intersection between art and tech. My name is Miguel, musician, and also have a big passion for communication and tech. My colleague Joe, entrepreneur in the tech industry and ex-venture capitalist. And finally, Fel, digital artist and mad hacker scientist. We're here to guide you through the ever-changing waves of how creators make amazing art through technology. Without further ado, let's get started. Welcome back to Wired Souls, you guys. How is it doing today? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Yeah? A little bit sick. Um, I won't lie. It's been a hard morning. But I'm here <laughs> with the guys, ready to roll for another one. But I'm glad to see you, Mig. Yeah, uh, it's good. Super excited to hear about your week off. Uh, some very exciting stuff. And Phil as well. You were off uh, quite a few days. Yeah, I took three day, days off. Middle trip to New York, which nice. was very successful. Yeah, tell us more about that. Well, I went to see some museums and spent some time with the, with the fam, with my mom and my dad, which was actually a pretty cool experience. You know, I've, I haven't spent that much time without my two brothers, with my parents. Mm, so it was super so nice. nice to be alone with them. Uh, especially, you know, I'm in my 20s, going through some stuff, just spending time to, to, to you know, uh, be with them and have some interesting conversations about life. And also visiting some really cool museum, like a uh, Museum of Modern Arts. Also went to Guggenheim and a Cooper Hewitt, where I actually saw a, an exhibition about uh, about signs. And uh, it, it, I had some thoughts about what we chatted last week uh, about the emojis with the, the meta stuff, which was super interesting. And it changed my perspective about like the extensibility of, of signs and how they can... Uh, basically, there's no limit about what you can uh, express with them. And yeah, yeah, I was super impressed by, by uh, how many... How many signs you can, uh, how many things you can interpret with signs? That's so cool, man. Did you get to share a bit of all the things you learned with your parents or was it? Yeah, yeah. It well, we, we talked a lot about, about art and, and what is art, you know, spent oh, some nice. time with the, with the art of the 1900s for, with the, for the 20th century with, the, you know, Monet, Picasso and all of these guys. And it brought a, a you know, a new perspective to my, my artistic approach. I feel like, uh, you know, I... In, in the past, I haven't spent that much time thinking about these guys and what they were doing for, for their time. And mm -hmm. it was interesting to ask myself, like, yeah, what what was their practices? What they, were they doing with the, with the painting and what were they painting about? And I had some some cool some cool thoughts about that, which uh, I shouldn't go too much in depth uh, right now because <laughs> there's still a simmering. But uh, yeah, it was a really nice trip. Nice. Amazing. Yeah, talking about art, it was the same on my side. I actually um, spent three days recording uh, my album in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> how long? How long have you been thinking about doing this? Honestly, it came up. I think it came up uh, this year, uh, like maybe a month ago. I was talking to my cousin, who's also an artist, and she was like, "You've been postponing that project for way too long." She was like, "Why? Why are you post postponing it?" And I was like, "Because I'm way too perfectionist when it comes to technical things." And she's like, "Just do it the way you feel it." Where do you feel the best playing your music? I was like, in the forest. <laughs> I was like, just go there and like record it in the forest. And I did. So I had like, I took three takes. I went uh, three days basically in a row and uh, it went super well. Like I felt super grounded. I felt aligned with the energy. The birds were singing. Like we can probably hear the birds in the recording. <laughs> I'm so excited about this. You know, it's like, it was kind of a, an interaction with the environment at the same time, which put less pressure on me for the technical stuff. Oh. I was like, it's all about, it's, it's the moment. We're just capturing one moment and it's all that matters. So uh, I think listening to it, since we we will be able to hear, hear everything around, I'll be less focused on like, uh, I don't like the way I sung this little part or whatever. I will be more open to the general experience. I see, I see. <clears throat> what was the kind of setup you had? Just like a, a mic on you? Yeah, or? I, yeah it shows like a mic that is Pretty good, but not crazy good. Like it's not crazy technical things, but just average, you know, like good sound. I put it in front of me. It captures the guitar plus my voice and then just one camera in front of me. So, you know, of course, I, I did think about promoting it a little <laughs> bit so I can make shorts. <laughs> I can make TikToks out of it. Of course, you know, you got to share, share yeah. the project a little bit as well. So I just had, I wanted to capture it in the simplest way possible. And I did. So I'm excited to to share it with you guys when when I will listen to it because I still haven't. Perfect. <laughs> Next uh, official soundtrack of the Wired Souls, bud. Ooh, <laughs> nice. 
I felt what you said kind of resonated with me. So uh, as you guys know, you know, I, I have like three kids myself and, uh, you know, I have them half of the time. The mom have them half of the time. And one thing I realized was, um, you know, I'm always with the three of them, right? Yeah. Whenever I'm chilling with them and it creates a situation where I'm basically kind of managing the the horde, right? I'm, I'm making sure everyone is alive. And, <laughs> but it, it's not the best setup to really connect on a one-to-one basis, uh, which I actually thought, Last mm. week, I wanted to do a lot more of, you know, taking them, you know, one by one, at least, you know, once a week to do like a special thing, you know, mm-hmm. with them, uh, mm. which is really aligned with what you said. Uh, I, I think I kind of over- overlooked that need for spending one to one special moments with each of your kids. Yeah. Uh, and it's something I actually told myself like very recently I wanted to do more. Well, so it's, it's funny that you kind yeah, of bring it up. That's funny, man. You also told me a, a while back when I first joined Lighthouse that uh, you, I think you pulled out a, a graph or you made a tweet tweet about that, about the, the time you spent with your kids only goes down uh, with, with yeah. the, the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was also thinking about that. And yeah, it, it was really a different dynamic from when I spent time with my, my two brothers and my, my parents. It's just a totally different, uh, not, a, not a playing field, but just, uh, you know, it's not the same. Uh, oh man, I have uh, thousands of thoughts and numbers like behind that. I did a <laughs> few of those. So um, like the one you're referring to is basically there's a bunch of graphs online you can find, but the time you're going to spend with your parents, once you move out of, you know, your, uh, your home with your parents, maybe around 18, 20, I think you've spent like 80% of the total time you'll ever spend with them kind of already, because then you're going to see them once a week, once every two weeks for an hour, an hour and a half. And so you kind of miss, yeah miss out on it unless you really focus on like capitalizing on that. So that was one, Another one, which is like to me super important, is just um, all the time you're going to spend with your loved one. You know, you're going to be sharing like half your money, half your free time, you know, vacation uh, choices, destination where you're going to live. Like it's such a big decision who you're actually getting in couple with that I don't think people are kind of uh, really internalizing. I, at least, you know, for me, it was kind of obviously a learning process over like the last decade and then we're still all learning. Uh, but I just think there's some small stuff like that, which are actually the most important things. Like how much time are you going to be spending with mm-hmm. your parents? Who are you going to be with when you have free time? Who is going to influence like your most important kind of decisions? Uh, all this kind of human aspect of who you spend time yeah, yeah. with is actually like super important. And that's super interesting. And also I feel like as you grow older, especially in, in your 20s, you know, you, you learn important stuff and you kind of grow as a becoming an adult, you know? And I don't know, it, it felt like a a special moment of like a, not sh- showing them or just a, they kind of get to know me on a new a newer level since yeah. you know I've started to, to work more on, on myself but also professionally and all that stuff so it feels like a, getting to know uh, old friends if <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. crazy yeah, it's and so cool. I'm also trying to to uh, be on on their perspective of like yeah. having a kid and seeing them grow into the world and what, what he or she's becoming blooming blooming, blooming. <laughs> And it's also so interesting to realize, I, I realized that personally, like how much we, we resemble our parents in terms of personality. Yeah, yeah. For Absolutely. Yeah. It is for so scary. That's <laughs> <laughs> me, man. <laughs> Do you feel that? Do you guys feel that? I don't. Uh, don't. There's a few traits that I share with my mom and my dad, but definitely not all of them. Oh, wow. Yeah. I also have my own. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, obviously, some overlap for sure. Yeah. Like you, can, you, can, you can see some The patterns, some stuff, right? The, some pattern, <laughs> but... Definitely not all the patterns uh, yeah. actually <laughs> yeah, make a uh, an imperative for myself. They yeah. make a hundred percent of it. It's kind of funny. Yeah, like I, I love my mom, by the way. I love you, my mom. <laughs> I'm still on, on, on some stuff, but I'm kind of super different from my, my dad in terms of, uh, I don't know, spirituality or just yeah. how I see things. But he's, uh, he's actually a photographer. He's a stills yeah. photographer on, on movie sets. And uh, the, his three kids actually... Uh, they, they all interact with cameras like all the time. You know, my, you my big brother is a, is a DP on movie sets as well. I actually, you know, play with cameras all the time. <laughs> and my little brother now actually studies uh, photography as well. So his three kids so, ended up with a camera in their hands. It's <laughs> crazy. But I, I agree with Joe that it's very often on the things we don't want to resemble them that we yeah. like focus. Right? <laughs> but I see myself like, for example, in, on some of my flows, I see that it's it's definitely my parents. And your dad, your dad is a musician as well, right? Your dad is, my dad is an artist. Yeah. yeah so that, oh, your dad's an artist. Yeah. As definitely well. got that, that, got that from him. <laughs> so much of that is, uh, transmitted like from parents to, to 
to kids. Like yeah. uh, even like the dancing culture. Yes. I feel when you have parents that dance, you tend yeah, to yeah. dance more. Singing yeah. at home. Like I don't have any of that. Obviously, I'm not a very like uh, artistic but you person fight. myself. There's the, the martial arts. Yeah, there's art, the yeah. martial arts. It's yeah. true. My grandparents yeah. were doing it. My mom as well. Oh, that's true. That's true. There's some heritage, I guess. In, do you think it's partly partly genes or it's mainly what you, you do at home and what you're exposed with when you're young? Uh, not, but, well, on the gene aspect, I think it's, uh, you know, if you come from like an athletic family, it obviously mm -hmm. helps. Um, so so we, did, we did have that. And the uh, then I, I think it's just a matter of like culture. So... Whenever I was a, a, a child, you know, my parents used to bring me to do judo like right away. It yeah. wasn't even like a question. And and my kids, you know, if you if you walk in their room, there's like a wall with like a bunch of my medals and <laughs> another wall with like my uh, kimonos, you know. So yeah, I'm trying to plant, <laughs> plant some, some seeds. seeds. Yeah. The, the floor yeah. is actually a mat. Like, <laughs> oh my God. So I'm doing everything I can. And they already fight a lot. I saw them fight at, yeah, yeah, at the park. Yeah, they fight all the time. I, I bring them to training. Like, so basically, I, as you know, guys, I train like a TriStar. And so I bring them every Sunday before the gym's open. So I have like uh, access so I can enter. Yeah. The gym is empty and they have like the entire gym for themselves. And so we, we don't really fight and do techniques. Like we just play around, you know, mess around. And uh, I just want them to have fun in that space. Yeah. Uh, and I, I feel like you're super curious also as a person and you really encourage them to be curious. Like I remember you saying the other day, like every time we're together, we, ch we do things. It's chaos, but we do things, right? <laughs> do things. Yeah, <laughs> and true. that's maybe Maybe you're drifting away, but yeah, yeah. Like to me, it's, uh, it's all about like, doing activities, spending like real time with them. Uh, yeah, I often say like, it's in the struggle time that you kind of build that bond with them. So, much. so you need to struggle like, yeah. let's cook together. It's going to be a mess. Let's yeah. go do that activity. Everyone's going to be around and screaming, but I'm going to be interacting with you and you're going to be like interacting with me. We're building that bond. It's We're living like stuff together. Best memories. Yeah. Like, yeah honestly, yeah. if you think about your childhood, no, I love it. I love <laughs> yeah. So, Maybe we can talk about the tool of the day. So just to remind you guys of the structure of the pod, we start by talking about one tool that we find interesting. Then after that, we talk about an artist that we find fascinating. And then we end up talking about uh, one. We have kind of a debate about something that is a bit of controversial. Um, so to start with the tool of the day, um, today we're talking about rich text to image, which is a tool that we all played with. Uh, maybe, Joe, if you could give a bit of like a yeah. technical explanation. Yeah, yeah perfect. So uh, it's a paper that has been pushed out a few months ago, like April, mid-April uh, 2023, uh, called Expressive Text to Image Generation with Rich Text. Um, just to make a shout out to the contributor, uh, it's from Song Wei Gi uh, and Jia Bin Huang from University of Maryland, Tui Sung Park from Adobe Research, and Jun Yan Zhu from Carnegie Mellon University. All right, so what's this tool about? What can you do with it? <coughs> I think it's super interesting and it's very, very cool. Uh, we'll show you some demos as always and you'll really like it. I found out about this paper in a Discord channel um, focused on prompting. Uh, and so we were obviously at Bloom. We always search for ways to make our tools better. Uh, and we were thinking about ways to make the prompting mechanism easier uh, and and so what I mean by that for kind of listeners is you can really start doing a text to image prompt in a simple way with a few words and then it generates the image and as you grow kind of more sophisticated with the notion of prompting you realize that there's actually quite a lot of things you can do to improve like the overall experience so you can be a lot more descriptive you can add elements like you know 8k render photorealism you know wide angle you can start to Talk not only about what you want to see, but the meta meta information around the image itself to create a better kind of final render of what you do. Um, so there's that. And then on prompting, you can also create like negative prompt stuff you don't want to see in your image. And so there's this entire kind of, they call it prompting engineering or just ways to make better prompt to get to a result that's, you know, either closely match what you want to achieve or, you know, at least gives... Um, you know, some form of alignment with the creative direction you're trying to walk into. And um, the context in which I was looking for tools that improved prompting was, can we guide newcomers, you know, first-time users, as to how to write a great prompt? Uh, 
because it's hard. And so the ways in which you can do that is actually make recommendation on what the next word should be. Mm -hmm. Whenever you do a Google search, you see that, right? Autofill, basically. Uh, we can do that. We can provide templates like Prompt Hero for all of you. We know we know we know that site. Mm -hmm. It's basically a site that combines you know images and the long form prompts that people wrote to have them. There's a bunch of Instagram page on that as well. Um, and so I was just basically curious to see what was uh, the latest state of the art work being done around better prompting. And then I stumbled on this paper, which is very very cool. Basically, what they mean by rich text is that for now, all, all, you know, basically all the prompting that is done is done with normal text. So you write on your keyboard and the text is going to drive the image. And what they're saying is that you can actually do a lot more with a rich text. And what they mean by rich text is ways to add to your text prompt. Uh, a deeper level uh, of information mm -hmm. and, and you're going to understand it right away. So a few things they make possible is actually, you know, you write a prompt like, I want to have a blue, uh, I want to have a house on the hill and then you're going to have that. And what you can do is select the word house, turn the color of the world to blue mm. and then the house itself is going to turn blue in the prompt, uh, in, the, in the render, in the final image. You can increase the size of a word and this word is going to gain weight compared to all the other words in the way in the ways in which your image is finally rendered. One thing I find amazing, you can actually select a word and add a footnote to that specific word that is going to give you, you know, a follow on prompt to that specific thing. So for the house, for example, I could select the word house and I could add, you know, bricked house um, in the 19... It's true. 10 style, you know, and this specific type of house. And then it basically allows you to start with a text prompt and be a lot more descriptive in everything that you want to kind of follow in that image. And this entire thing falls within a broader topic than that to me is kind of a very needed element of uh, AI generated text to image kind of images, which is, you know, the editing part or just being able to start from that first draft of inspiration and just being able to work on it right from the kind of generation layout. And so with this new technology, you can basically be extremely descriptive. You can, you can choose styles. You can put words in italics, which are going to change things. In our case, you could create, you know, do me a render of a, you know, a puffy jacket. And then the word jacket, you put it in blue. And then the puffiness, you increase the size of the world. Yeah. So it becomes more and more puffy. Then we can That's start convenient. to edit and add a lot of yeah. things, you know, from a single kind of text prompt. The way they do that, just like so to, to wrap it up from like a technical level, uh, is basically the way they design the final image is what they call region based. So that every word, its impact on the final render is actually clustered to a specific area. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were to say, um, show me again, like this red, you know, a house on top of a hill, traditional way to kind of model that would be to give you like one render from this entire text prompting. What they do is they isolate every word with the components of that image. So the word house is actually going to refer to the pixel area that represents the house. And so when you change that, it doesn't change anything else. It just, it just changed this specific area. Uh, so you could see the way, I think a simple way to see it would be you could have just this image or you could have two images, you know, the the orange background, and then the, yeah. on top of it, a sticker of that robot. Yeah, it's two different images, and so mm. you can modify each of them uh, by selecting the the word in the prompt that was kind of referring to that specific area. So uh, it, it it's kind of a puzzle more than just like one clear mm. kind of image, uh, which is very cool. So yeah, I think there's tons of use cases even for ourselves. I I'm thinking about ways to kind of integrate that in the product. It's all open source. Uh, it's very cool and it's also super recent as I said like it's been out for two months yeah. for creators it's a great way for you to experiment and try to be a, a bit more specific in, in the render you're trying to create you, you, you can use Photoshop uh, but for people that are not kind of uh, you know uh, expert with it uh, this is kind of an interesting thing yeah. also pointing one of the researchers from Adobe Research uh, so that's kind of interesting. nice one interesting setting that I found um, on the tool is, I mean, you mentioned it, the italic setting, right? You can choose an artist style that you want to, so let's say you want to, I don't know, you, your house, you want it in a Moonist style or in a Van Gogh style. 
Um, I find it interesting that you're like able to do that. I do ask myself the question, like, do you guys feel like it's, it's bringing the question of like rights and copyrights to a deeper level? Or do you think it's just a part of the same debate that there usually is in, in the AI space? Mm. Gen AI space. I definitely don't like to use like artists' name, right? But like with the the artists from the 20th century, like they they're kind of tied to like whole artistic movements, so it feels less like a, appropriative. But still, I, I feel there's still something to to work out there. Yeah. Before I could just use like any artist names <coughs> in my prompts. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. It's like uh, you know, Ghost Riders. Drake album. <laughs> <laughs> it's been taken out like very quickly. Once Did you listen to the album? No, though? man. I, I haven't wanted no. to listen Me to it. Me too. It got taken, taken down. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, I agree. I agree. I think in that context, the reason why it's working is because, as Fell is saying, they this style is almost like representative of a movement. I don't know if like the style of these individuals specifically. It's kind of, uh, you know, public use. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's just so you know, legally, if people can actually, I, I don't yeah. know the legal intricacies yeah. of it. And also I'm, I'm thinking of the artist's perspective. I don't know how much an artist with a very clear, specific vision in their mind would want to use like so much of an yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, agree. Yeah. I agree. Me too. That's a good this point, is a feature yeah. I won't be using. Yeah, same. So. That's interesting. Great. Even even like a, for like smaller or more uh, recent artists, uh, I saw a, an example of a, a photographer that has a lot of uh, of steel rusted steel plates in his images, and I saw an architect using his name in, in a prompt, and it, it, the result is a lot of rusted steel in the images, and I just find found that like interesting. I, I started to think about like where his images were, so they ended up into the the, the training model, and also just like uh, about the the collective art of like uh, these models you know like we've all contributed images to the internet at some point in the last yeah. like 20 years so i don't know it made me think about like these models being like the uh, it's like the result of everyone's hard uh, art in the recent years which is kind of interesting yeah I, I think this brings us to like the you know uh, debate we're kind of totally. almost always kind of stumbling into here which is you know whose art is that um yeah. I think in the case where you actually use another artist's name in your prompt, we, we approach kind of a very gray line. Yeah, for sure. that's for <laughs> it's sure. kind of tough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as we've said in a previous episode, you know, Japan has actually kind of came out with very AI friendly, AI creator friendly mm -hmm. terms when it comes to like IP and stuff. So uh, this is a discussion that we will have many times, but that every country will have, you know, many times as well. And as they start to kind of interact. So I, I wonder where the line is. Uh, I, I, I do feel personally uncomfortable with the notion that someone could prompt, you know, your name, for sure. Mig, to generate like a song. Oh and, my God, and, yes, and, yeah. for sure, for sure. Yeah, that's Especially crazy. after you blow up once you're out <laughs> <laughs> For sure. To come back to Reach Text, I'm, I'm still curious to have your take, Phil. Did, did you play with the tool and how, how did it feel? I haven't played with Reach Text, but what I what I know is that I play with like, different models like Medrini and Dali uh -huh. and they don't work the same in how you prompt and how you weigh your, your text. Yeah. And I, I, I thought about like Reach Text as a way to streamline like how you prompt like throughout yeah. many different AIs. I feel like that could be a good way to to make it, I'm not sure if you agree, but uh, to make it like interoperable between uh, the, these models, so you don't only have to learn one language and you can put <coughs> in AIs uh, after yeah. the fact. I do find it interesting in the way that it's pretty good. Like I played a bit with the tool. I <laughs> tried to make a very creative pizza, <laughs> and it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was fun. And it was actually pretty pretty efficient. Only things that at some point my olives got outside of the pizza and were more in the background <laughs> than in, on the pizza. I think but this is art. <laughs> I think this is fun. They made a nice pizza too with pineapple on yeah, it. Yeah, actually took this like as a base. Um, but what I actually was wondering um, is. Um, how can we find inspiration for prompts as a as a very newbie? You mentioned Prompt Hero just two minutes ago. Um, I heard, I remember that it was a, a great way. But like, it's crazy how prompting is becoming the new way of interacting with you know machines, right? Um, I don't know. Back back to the sixties, we had to learn how to manage a keyboard, yeah, um, to be able to create. And now prompting is becoming the big thing. 
Um, so how, what would be your recommendation to like get creative on this? I think it's practice. Um, the example I have, which is like <laughs> the worst example ever, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there's like a meme on that, but uh, yeah, I mean, the first time I started to look, look for stuff online on the internet with search engines, my initial set of fronts or, or queries were not the most efficient to get me to where <laughs> I wanted true, to go. True. And, um, and then I learned, right, the languages, how to, how to get to where it's I wanted true. to go. Uh, it's a good parallel. Yeah. With, it's, a good <laughs> <laughs> it's a good parallel. So <laughs> the same way I've learned how to use, use search engines to uh, get to my uh, targeted destination, I think people are going to be able to, you know, improve their skills with prompting. I just think it's something you, you do over and over again and, yeah. and you find it. It's like, you know, my mom, when it she was like searching way. for stuff online, she had like no idea what to write. Right? No, she was like, like this. literally like a couple of years ago, I remember my mom being like, how do we take the bus from like this street? This street? <laughs> like she was literally asking the question like she was talking to a human being. Yeah, she, she was already at chat GPT level. Exactly, so, exactly yeah. man. So... I find it interesting. Obviously, it's becoming more and more intuitive, right? Um, yeah. But the it's keywording true. aspect is still... We're kind of trying to to have a discussion with the machines and we don't have like a... a same we language. don't share the same language. We just yeah. use text because that's what we get. But yeah, I think it's... If we can develop a like a rich text to, to image that yeah. is basically purposely built to communicate with this, yeah. we might have a better conversations in the end. Yeah. They definitely come up with a much more intuitive way of doing that. For, for sure, the prompting yeah. experience is so much better. Um, I agree. And on, on sure. your comment, Phil, though, uh, that, you know, this, you know, certain forms, perhaps which texts are just like other forms of fronting could, you know, enable interoperability of query across models. I mean, what would be kind of, how, how would you define that? And what would be kind of the intended purpose? Would it be, I generate one prompt and I get the same image depending on the no, model? No, I just think I you describe a scene in the same way. Like if I start to prompt mid journey and I really learn how to do the weights there because you know you need to do a certain command, then I go to a new AI model and it uses the same language. I'm good. I don't have to relearn anything. All right, let's move on to the next topic. I think we've yeah. talked a lot. Conclusion, try it up. Uh, it's the most extensive way to be able to create editing capabilities in your image from the prompt itself. Link so, in description. Yeah. <laughs> Link in description. Yeah. Amazing. So let's talk about the artist of the day. Um, maybe Fel, you would like yeah, to yeah. introduce the artist. Yeah, the artist of the day is Rifik Anadol, who's a super, uh, super famous AI artist who's like at the cutting edge of, of this tech and how, what you can do with it. And actually, I, I was... Uh, in New York last week, as I said in the beginning of this pod, and I got to see like the, his new uh, his new show called Unsupervised on Floor One at, at MoMA, and I don't know if you know what it looks like, but it's just like a, a giant mm -hmm. thing. It's like a giant box rendered in, in 3D space. So there's a depth to it, and you just sit in front of that, and it's like I don't know how, how tall it is, like probably 10, 15 meters, and it's first it's super immersive and it's like alive, so it it, it moves in front of you, and you really get like. I don't know, you instantly get into a meditative state and then you see people looking at it and being all yeah. blown away. So on the experience level, it was really, really beautiful. And also it's not a, it's not like a, it's not baked in. It's actually, a, it's actually alive. It's rendered in real time and it's taking information wow. from sensory inputs like cameras, uh, microphones and, and weather and wind data through like uh, open weather APIs, which is uh, crazy to me. And yeah, so it, it never stops like uh, changing, you know, if the museum gets busy, then you're going to see like the, the artwork start to move in a certain way. Crazy. Yeah, but is it a, a 3D screen? No, or? it's not a 3D screen. So the, it's a flat screen, but the actual render is, uh, 3D. is, is 3D. So it's like a, a box. So you can see a certain mm. depth and it, it's rend rendered in the same point of view as where you're you're sitting, when, where you're watching it. So it really feels like you're... You're, you're right in front of this thing. It's kind of genius. What I find so fascinating about it is the hype around it. The guy has like nearly one million yeah, followers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he ha has been like interacting with AI mm -hmm. for a very long time. Uh, we we actually went back on his as in on his Instagram up to like I don't know 2016, and he was already talking about AI. So he was definitely here before the hype. <laughs> <laughs> but um, still amazing to see the hype that he, he generates. Um, I try to think about why. People actually like it so much. And I think it's because it comes up with a story that really touch 
emotions, you know? Yeah. Because he's going to, even like if you look at his photos and videos, like he's always interacting with architecture. He's projecting mm -hmm. his art on a big building. He's projecting his yeah. art on uh, in, in the MoMA, right? Yeah. So I think there is a dimension where he, he actually knows how to trigger um, emotions in people because he uses human story. Um, so probably what's going to actually bring AI to a router. What do you um, mean by he uses human stories? Yeah, maybe it sounds too strategic in my <laughs> mind, but all I'm trying to say is that he obviously, you know, his entire project is to take human data and this, and there is a long process. So people feel emotions about yeah, this. I think the data sets plays a huge role then, mm -hmm. in his piece. Yeah. And, you know, it, 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 it put a huge emphasis on the fact that this is the data that, you know, was made over 200 years. So this mm -hmm. is where you get triggered as a human being because yeah, you're I like, see. oh my God, there is history. It's bigger than us, right? And I think... Personally, I wonder if this is how he got to be that big and literally have his gallery in, in MoMA. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I think you're right in that the story is, is playing kind of a big part. Um, and the story being exactly what you said is that when, once you interact with the artwork from Rafik, you're actually interacting with humanity's kind of fingerprint you know, over a very long period of time. and uh, Something that's historical but also real time right so mm -hmm. it's almost as if you were not looking at a piece but you were looking at a performance exactly. kind of the yeah. art is performing in, in front of you uh which i think creates kind of a a sense of in the moment like getting caught in the moment when you when you look at this artist's art um it's true that he's been kind of playing around with tech for a while uh this is definitely kind of his style, um, I, which I find I, I think is super cool. Uh, yeah. It's also great for people to kind of realize that you can use AI to follow really creative, unique processes, creative processes, and, and coming up with a piece that is you know unique, incredibly unique, um, so unique that. Even the artist himself doesn't know what it's going to look like you know, the next second, which 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 I think is amazing. Um, so, so when it comes to like refix art in itself, to me, what's really striking about it is um, the fact that you are seeing a performance uh, that's driven by the collective us, you know, kind of in front of you, which I think is cool. Uh, So, so this is great. Um, I do have some, so I, I, I checked at the end, we talked about that with, with Phil a little bit, but you know, MoMA, they did kind of a, a video on AI art and, and just how that you know, fits with certain type of artists. I think Rafik was kind of talking in that video along with other artists. Um, to me, these types of videos that they've made, and yeah. we're going to link it in the show note, I, I do have some struggle with. Like I, I, I mean, there <laughs> the was... The marketing is great. <laughs> yeah, there was like tons of technical inaccuracies in that. Uh, the way they were kind of actually framing the work and how it differentiated from other models was drastically romanticized. You know, I think, you know, and it's called unsupervised and they're making this whole kind of unsupervised learning as something that was incredibly unique and revolutionary. Like all models are based on unsupervised learning. I think they make the point that DALI is kind of made out of supervised learning, yeah. which is obviously nonsense. Uh, so lots of like technical inaccuracies uh, in the way it was kind of brought up to the public in that video, which I understand it's kind of a promotion. They're coming from an artistic angle. They're not like an AI, mm -hmm. uh, you know, technical uh, institution. Uh, but still, I think, you know, And now we're more of research and you could have avoided a bunch of those. And there was, you know, this narrative that was kind of put forward by some people in the video, which was, you know, AI is all about like capitalism and, uh, you know, people trying to make money with it. And it's kind of a scary technology while AI is just statistic, it's statistic basically. So, you know, I... I think you can criticize a bunch of uses of AI, especially in the context of like social media and stuff, uh, like recommendation algorithms and what they optimize for. 
but there's a million use cases of AI that are going to, you know, reduce um, the cleavage between rich and the poor that are going to, you know, improve science in meaningful way. I mean, this, this has happened over the last decade and it's continuing mm-hmm. to happen. So I just think, I wonder, my, my whole point with this is when you're bringing AI to the mainstream. Exactly. Do you have a at least you know responsibility to provide accurate information? That's one, and also to avoid you know building up on on a narrative that's actually like false, right? Um, so I did I did have some issues with that video the way it was brought up and just. Like, I definitely agree with you. I think it's still like I really like the fact that you use the word romantizing, like mm-hmm. the romanticization of the entire mm-hmm. thing. I think it's what is making this project so big. And is making this project literally in the MoMA now. It's because this is what humans need to sign, <laughs> you know, to sign on I agree, vision, it's marketing, it's right? marketing. So it's this is marketing. how you get, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to actually look at it. Exactly. And at it. The reason why it, it got so big, in my opinion, is because it, they are super good at marketing. Like most of it, it's, it's marketing. If you look at the videos, there is a branding, there is a style. If you look at his background, I think... He's really working with great artists in videography. Um, he's able to have like a, a changing background, whether it is black, whether it is white. And then the music theme is very, very um, similar uh, mm-hmm. throughout the different I videos. Think it's, uh, it's, so, it is well crafted. Yeah. He's working on the vision, he's working on the experience, he's working on the sensitivity. And I think I personally, as a creative, get sensitive to this. So because he's giving me a great experience, he's giving me a great story. So I was like, I want to know yeah. more. It feels a. Uh, they feel festive, uh, his pieces or their pieces with Hervé Canada Studio. Like it's all, it feels like a celebration of, of human history, especially yeah. for, for, for MoMA's, you know, it's, it's going back on 200 years of, of art and actually like some of the most important art uh, in modern history. But also, you know, he did one with the uh, New York city where he, he fed the uh, I think hundred million images of New York. And then you get new images of New York that doesn't exist, but they feel like New York. So f- as a, I'm not a New Yorkian, but if I would be as yeah. if I would see these pieces as a New Yorkian, I think I would, you know, I would absolutely love it and have a great time. No, I think he's a genius because he's able to bring AI to really, really sensitive things to people, like literally bringing it to New York or bringing it yeah. to ba- Barcelona. What he did, like playing the building. with the it's established yeah. culture. I think the scale of it plays a big part in how popular it is. Yeah. It's always like big data sets, big cities. So, so with this, I actually have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it seems like for art to be valuable, people need to justify it with work. Like exactly before, it was I'm the only one that can technically draw, you know, the Mona Lisa, or you know, I I do this thing that other people can do. Um, even with singing, I mean, I'm able to touch these notes that no one else is kind of capable of, of reaching. And you just had kind of a crafty skill set related to it. And as tech is kind of finding its way into into art, you know, in a more kind of meaningful way, because tech is growing in, a, in an exponential fashion, uh, this justification of work and, and skill set as being uh, what brings value to art uh, is actually being questioned, and and I'm personally r- really okay with that. I, I I don't think. I think what what makes art, uh, art is a form of expression, and what makes great art is how how much what you're trying to express resonates with like other people. I mean, it, it starts with like a a feeling, a thought, something that you're trying to convey and how complicated conveying this thing was Mm -hmm. to me is unrelated to uh, how valuable this actual emotion that you're trying to convey is. Mm -hmm. Um, So the art is in the emotion you're trying to make people live, you know, with what you're kind of bringing, you know, to the world. And, And when I hear that, you know, with this New York piece which was trained on tons and tons and tons of images, Mm -hmm. I don't have like the context on when this was made. But today you can do that with, I mean, 2000 pictures of New York and you're good. Like you can train your models in a super efficient way and, and I'm sure have renders that really doesn't require you. Like there's no need on a technical level for you to have 100,000 images to mm-hmm. be able to generate what you're trying to generate. So I wonder if the 98,000 images more that you took is not 
marketing. You know, it's it's, 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 a, it's a branding, right? It's look, look, this is so unique. But all this is is analog to like yeah. the initial feeling, which was, hey, what is New York if it wasn't actually the yeah. New York that we know, which I think is cool, which I think is great. So I wonder, I, okay, my point is with this whole kind of emergence of technology and AI in the creative sphere, are people going to um, create complexities that are unwarranted in front of them to justify, you know, the uniqueness of their work? I don't think that's a path that, you know, resonates with me or excites me at all. Uh, but mm -hmm. I wonder if that's going to be a trend. I'm not saying Rafik is doing it, although I'm kind yeah. of implying it uh, with 100,000 Im images to train kind of New York. And I think you can have like great models with 5K image, easy. Uh, but yeah, that's that's those are my thoughts. I, I don't think we should overcomplexify something that works, you know, efficiently uh, yeah. just to so prove much. out work. Mm -hmm. now that's super interesting. Just a question of uh, what is art and Again. with art redefining itself through the, the ages. Also makes me think of the beginning of the MoMA when they did a an exhibition. They started to put a, a machine made a, a intricate pieces in mm -hmm. the museum as art, and that's right when you know a, a craftsmen are started to lose their jobs because of the industrialization and the the, the the factory line started producing more pieces of better quality and of better design. And it it does feel like yeah, kind of the same right now with the the AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's true. Yeah, I think it bring, brings us to the last um, little part of the podcast, which is um, the, the debate of the day. We're actually going to use the, the same topic, the artist of today, um, because, again, his, some of his main big lines in his work is like using AI to make reality dream and hallucinate. Um, what does it mean to be an AI in the 21st century um, what can machines do with someone else's memory? These are like some great existential questions. And it's bringing us to the question, who's the creator? <laughs> the machine or the artist? Yeah, I, I, I can start. Um, at the end of the day, I think the artist is, is, is the creator. Um, there's a process, there's an intent. Uh, there's obviously tools to get there, which is where kind of the machine is interacting. But... But the overall intent is coming from the creator. This being said, there are slash should be rules around how you can interact with the tool. And mm -hmm. I know rules and art, <laughs> those are not like two words that fit really well together. But when it comes to using an AI to prompt, using another artist art or name, as we've mm -hmm. kind of alluded to, to me, this crosses kind of a line. I don't have a... Uh, I think there's a very deep argument to be had and around, you know, what's correct and what's not correct. Mm -hmm. um, but the feeling I'm trying to convey is um, whenever you start to take too much of uh, another artist's kind of DNA uh, mm -hmm. uh, within your art, then, then, then it becomes, uh, you know, questionable whether this is yours or this is mm -hmm. someone else's. Um, so this is kind of the first the first thought I would have. I think the prompter, the intent, the emotion you're trying to convey yeah. really starts from the artist. Then maybe a quick example I think it's cool that I would like to kind of uh, express is if you are, you know, creating something using AI and then putting it out into the world, uh, into the world and then, you know, your model gets trained on top of this thing that you've yeah. put into the world. Uh, and then you retrain your machine to generate kind of a new input, you know, from that revised kind of uh, data set that includes, you know, what you've built. Really rapidly, you can start to see a world where chat GPT, for example, is going to be trained on 90% of chat GPT created data. And so you can see like these filter bubbles basically where mm. what you knew, what you created with it, is actually going to be recycled into how you're trained to say the future. And so you can have this kind of um, recursive uh, knowledge that's kind of passed on and passed on. So, so I'm, I'm, I'll try to be clear. I think there's going to be a point over the next decade where 90% plus of the content created online yeah. is going to be AI generated. Um, That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, your images on socials are going to be, you know, retouched by yeah. AI. You know, articles are going to be written as they start to be now, you know, mm. mainly by AI. 
chatbots, you know, content uh, moderators on on like Reddit and stuff like that. Like a lot of it is going to be like AI driven. Uh, you're just going to have so much more content because the cost of created, creating content is basically your cost of running GPUs versus like all the time it takes you as someone, you know, to create content online. And so you're going to have these models that are going to be built and trained off of the internet, data mm-hmm. on the internet, but this data on the internet is going to be created by AI in the first place. So the the future knowledge online is going to be much more influenced by past knowledge, I guess is where I'm trying to go with all of this, which brings you the question, you know, where is kind of novelty actually going to emerge from or, or, or come from? Um, Interesting. Maybe, maybe I drifted from... Uh, yeah, but I, I, think I, I think I can jam on that. Yeah. I think like the the art, the, the result of, of art is not a... It's... It, it's a, a process that takes a long time to, you know, to simmer like a, a an art piece comes, a, it takes a long time to, 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 to bear fruit. And I'm asking, the, I'm asking myself the question of like, uh, does the AI remembers? Like if, if the AI can't recall the, the, what gave you the idea or what's the process or what's the, what's the thing you went through that produced that or influenced that? that art piece, like, is it, for me, it's not a, that, that points me in the direction that, you know, the, the artist uh, stays uh, the one with the, is staying the one with the, the paintbrush in their hands. Like the eye is a, is a mean, not an end in that sense. Oh. Okay. And, and then in the context where you create like auto GPT agent, which are basically agents that are capable of like drawing what's the next thing they should be doing, you know, based off an objective. Uh, if, if you gave them like a set of instructions, but then they are the one. Okay, example. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. You uh, love those. I think it was Google that did the study. It was super interesting. So they put up a few like uh, agent uh, in a three D world. Like imagine a game. Yeah. Like Auto GPT agent, uh, and they gave them like an initial set of instruction, which mm-hmm. is like go there, do that, go there, do that, go there, do that. Uh, and then, you know, do whatever you want to do. And so these agents, they started to cross path. Mm-hmm. Someone had a birthday. This was the, it's birthday. And so they invited the other agents to the birthday uh, party. And so some showed up, some didn't show up, some had better things to do, some had a party. And then, you know, maybe friendships get created and, and this is, you know, life kind of taking, taking on its own form. And so if you look at week one, this is very much, you know, the creators, you know, Google's work, right? You could you could call this a piece of art and, and this is like, you know, their piece of art. But then if you let this thing run for a thousand years oh. and then you come back, right? And so you've had generations, you've uh, had yeah. story. Like, is, That's this, crazy. is this your artwork? I, I think it is, but maybe it's theirs. I find, I find it interesting that you guys, I, I feel like you're able to imagine what it means. But <laughs> for me, I still have such a hard time understanding what it means. Like, I, I you know? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like the technology seems, to me, it seems so out there that I have a hard time processing what it means, you know? Um, just just a little note. Just got to imagine that you are, you've been created by Google and you're oh. alive right now. <laughs> so. Good to watch. It makes me think about the, uh, actually one of my, if not my favorite show, it's called Al- Altered Carbon. And it's a, you know, it's a dystopian future where it, uh, there's a, are there are super advanced AI. They actually AI hotels, uh, like so you can actually stay at your AI place, and the AI takes care of you, uh, takes care of you. And the main uh, the main protagonist actually have been with the same AI for quite some time. And in this world, you can you can live for you know thousands of years. And at some point, the the AI actually have a malfunction, and he, he starts to to bug, and that puts the the protagonist in really dangerous situations sometimes. So you know, throughout the, the series, you 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 see the, the the AI being torn apart between having to reboot for uh, his his customer safety, and not wanting to because he develops such a, a powerful bond with the, with him. And this show actually, I don't know why, but I it's one of my favorite show. As I said, I watched yeah, it a couple like, times. Look, there's like a million things with that. So. Like with, you can already imagine, like you could wear a watch. I could, I could take a watch and give it to my kid. Okay. And then they wear it until they die. And, uh, then this watch would have like 
registered everything that they've said they've done like throughout yeah. their lifetime. And so you create like an AI model that's based off of like all their input, the way they interacted. And so you have basically their souls and their yeah. entire lifetime like living forever. And then you can think about their child interacting with it and being, oh, I want to talk to my dad. But when he was 15. Wow. And then you could kind of scale back <laughs> to that. Sounds cool though. <laughs> yeah, it sounds cool. It sounds cool. But then, then, then push it a bit further and it's like, Okay, um, now I'm saving all of this like data, right? And then let's say, you know, he has like, your kid has a uh, financial crisis and then you he, he, he wonder he can't afford, you know, keep it, keeping, you know, the mm. safe file, you know, the, the cost. It's too exp- prohibitive. Like, I mean, is this someone dying for real? Like your relationship to death? It's going to change. It's going to change. And I... I I don't know, like uh, erasing someone's souls like that. Whoa. Well, oh, yeah. And already on, on digital records, like uh, only videotapes, my, my parents, when I, I grew up, like they always had a camera on us. And now I have actually on, on this drive, I have a copy. Mm. It's basically my entire childhood. Wow. And it's it's the same, you know, j- just with video, with video cam, uh, cameras, like if I would lose that, I, I couldn't lose it because it's, you know, it, it's backed up enough, but it does feel like it would erase a big portion of my life and my brothers and my existential question for you do you watch this content often <laughs> no not often right they actually so. gave it to us uh, for christmas uh, last year <laughs> because it was on the uh, old the uh, old tapes and uh, they had to digitize it which is uh, quite the process so they went through the process and put it on the yeah. uh, on the drive and gave each of my my brothers a, a hard Call drive you. Call me a boomer, but I, I but don't yeah. think we will. To respond to your question, I don't often. We did uh, we, we did do a, a few uh, a few sessions where we watch a lot of them, and there's some really funny stuff. You know, he only watches it when he does uh, MDMA. At yeah, <laughs> <laughs> when he's trying to make a cool little video. Oh uh, <laughs> God! To put some oh uh, God! From his no, I don't often. Even my all my photography work. You know, I started uh, taking pictures like uh, in my younger years and I always had a camera up to my friend's face like I was that guy you know filming everything yeah. super random stuff you know my my cats and all that stuff and all that stuff is, is sits on the, on some hard drives and I really don't often uh, open it maybe a uh, point 25 times a year <laughs> I don't think we have the brain and emotional power to consume that much it's when pretty, somebody uh, dies I think we go through as we go through a process naturally as human beings that make us realize that somebody dies we might use it as a tool for a little bit to process the trauma and the PTSD. But at some point, I personally believe that we're going to go. Man, I, I think you're starting from like the personal angle, uh, which is like, uh, you know, my mom, dad, and can I interact with them like later on? I think this is like a personal question, but you can think about people in history, uh, like Einstein, for example, and then you could interact with him at a specific age or another that you really like, you know, get, you know, that part of that experience. But yeah. isn't it what we already do with books, with content, with no. media, with videos? Yeah, but it's not, it's, first of all, the content that you get is only what they've written. So it's not interactive. You can't ask questions. Mm, you I can't. Get you. So I, I'd like to be able to like talk to, for example, I, I'd like to be able to talk to uh, UFC champion Georges St. Pierre when he was, you know, before he did his first UFC fight. And I'm about to do my first. I'm like, man, how do you feel? Like, how do you manage that? Like, what's in your mind right now? How do you felt after? What would you have changed? Like, being able to, like, my my thoughts shift a lot, uh, obviously. And, and yours, everyone's kind of, we, we move a lot, we grow a lot. And, and what we write in a book is not the same thing as what we might be thinking right now. Uh, and I think there's value in being able to interact with, some people at specific points in their life and to have like these discussions when they had like this perspective that's closer to yours and, and what you're experiencing. I mean, look, you could have discussions with like, um, you know, someone who was like, who had drug issues, who started like a therapy and, and you could talk to that person before, uh, you know, how do you feel? What's yeah. brought, what's, what's you there? Uh, it, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's some value in that. Obviously, there's some like big privacy concern and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but you know, bringing and and, and there are some uh, companies like bringing that on chain even like so, so that it stays forever. <laughs> <laughs> like people are really going oh like intense God. with that hardcore. Man, it's when you say about the meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. Like two thousand years ago, he was just writing to himself, and somehow this this work was preserved, and now we have access to 
the thoughts of the private yeah. thoughts of like one of the greatest emperors. And wouldn't you like to talk to your, yourself when you were 15? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds cool. I don't know if I would do it every day though. No, yeah. no, no. I wouldn't do it every day. Yeah. I think it's a great tool. But <laughs> to be continued, guys. It's like bullish. Oh, God. To be because continued. not convinced. No. No. <laughs> to be continued. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, guys. Okay. Take care, Miguel. Yeah, it was a great care. episode. That Thank was a fun much. one. Bye-bye.